In this episode of The Human Advisor, Preston McSwain joins me and we talk about how every advisor should be transparent, keep their practice simple, and provide peace of mind for their clients. We touch on his Alabama roots and how he enjoys this great city of Boston. You don't want to miss it. Tune in. People want to know that they're talking to someone who can understand you know, what they're going through. Needs, wants, desires, fears. Money is highly emotional. At the end of the day, we're talking to people and we need to understand what's important to them first and foremost. Preston, how are you? Doing wonderful, thank you. Great to finally get together. This is my first time in Boston. It's yes. a beautiful city, it's so clean, we're enjoying ourselves. Thank you so much for having us in your office. No, really great to have you here and look forward to showing you around the city a little bit later as well. Awesome, awesome. I am so excited to be speaking with you, but before we kind of dive into the conversation, I remember the first time that you and I spoke. Um, we had a brief Twitter exchange and you were like, give me a call. And I remember I was sitting in a coffee shop in San Francisco and you just gave me so much wisdom about the business, about life, and it really grew my respect for who you are and what you do. Um, I'm Liberian, as you know. We talked about that before we kind of started the podcast. And my middle name, as I share with you, is Wontalo, and that means um, son of the wise man. And I feel like with my background, losing my dad, I always gravitate to people like you that are extremely wise, that can give me wisdom in my life. So I just want to say thank you on camera for just imparting all of the wisdom that you do. And I can't wait for our guests to hear more about who you are and kind of get some of those gems as well. Uh, well, thank you. I, um, I don't know about wise, as a lot of people say, <laughs> you know, made a lot of mistakes maybe. Um, so I really appreciate that. And as we spoke, um, you know, I, 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 it was just my mom and me growing up as well. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, to hear you say that means a lot because I still think of myself as that as that little kid that 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 didn't know anything, and right. so um, you know, I'm I'm learning all the time still, and, and definitely um, I really appreciated our talks, and and have, and have learned a lot already from you. So thank you back. Let's talk about that, right? You grew up in Alabama. We talked about that on the walk and talk. Um, your upbringing. You talked about your mom and just kind of noticing how you weren't really wealthy. And I talked to you and I shared that you know I didn't feel any financial stress. But as you got older, you kind of picked up these signs. So what was it like growing up in that single parent household and growing up in Alabama? Well, you know, like we talked, um, you know, even though thinking back, we didn't have a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I never really knew it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of love, uh, a lot of um, emphasis on, you know, giving back to the community, even though we didn't necessarily have a lot. And it wasn't until I got much older, looking back, that I realized, oh, gee, hang on, right? There were yeah. a lot of little nips and tucks that mom did uh, so, that we could, so that we could make it. And, um, you know, I think thinking back on that, uh, you know, really just staying humble, you know, regardless of where you end up is just so important and understanding your roots and, and appreciating that and not forgetting. So thank you for bringing it up. What, what was like that moment in your household that you realized that this isn't right? I know you talked about like looking through your refrigerator in our kind of pre-talk before we started, but did you notice anything that was like, you know what, um, my mom is trying her best to make sure that I have a good life while you were a kid? Oh, geez. Um, you know, my mom, uh, my mom just, you know, did so many great things. And I think, you know, looking back, it... Um, I didn't notice, uh, mm -hmm. which was a blessing. And how she did it, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but you know, to be able to kind of scrap and save, um, single mom, uh, school teacher um, in Alabama, it uh, it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but she made it and provided, and 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 we, we and we always had something left over to give back as well, which is always, I think, important. I can tell, and um, we'll talk about your giving and your philanthropy a little later in the episode. But I've never been to Alabama. I know that we have people on our staff that had brief stints in Alabama, but what was life in that state like? I feel like it's, it's curi I'm curious about that. Yeah, well, I think um, it was certainly different than up here to some extent. Um, you know, I think it was just, um, it was just, it was just different um, in terms of, um, you know, certainly not being the financial capital of the world. That's for Doc on Shore. And mm -hmm. so, Growing up, I never really had any exposure to investing or never any exposure to um, the finance world. Um, wasn't 
wasn't part of what I wanted to do growing up. Um, didn't understand that that was really a path, um, a profession, um, a way to a way to make a living, but also a way to get back. Um, and so, uh, so how did it ended up in this field? Sometimes I I kind of scratch my head, and, you know, not sure, but uh, but it certainly uh, I've certainly been blessed. It's beautiful to hear your story because it you're just shamelessly taking your shot at whatever is calling you at that time, right? And you talked about not knowing, um, I guess, how to be politically correct in some settings. That led you into some spaces and some places that you probably never foresaw yourself being in. So talk to us about finding finance, right? How did you get into the industry? Well, I, like I said, I had no idea the industry really existed that much. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather, who really kind of was my father figure growing up, um, you know, kind of dabbled a little bit in mutual funds and got me somewhat interested. But I wanted to be um, uh, an engineer growing up. My uncle was an engineer and really thought highly of him. And and it wasn't until I got into it and had done some uh, some some looking around and said, "Gee, not so sure this is for me." Um, but I had taken an elective um, in finance from this guy, great guy, uh, Dr. Featherston. Um, who was an old Wall Street trader, uh, kind of burnout guy. How he ever ended up in Alabama, I'm not sure. Uh, but um, he kind of uh, you know, inspired me, and, and I got interested in it. And we went to visit some trading floors in New York. And, and I looked around and said, well, gee, this isn't, uh, this isn't engineering. This seems, uh, this seems pretty exciting to me. And uh, went back and changed my major. And, and then all of a sudden, realized there weren't any jobs in Alabama. So I needed to find one. <laughs> That's, that's, I had a similar experience. So when I worked at the first firm that I worked at, right, I saw that there was a huge demographic of people that just did not get the memo. They weren't having these discussions at the dinner table. Um, their families probably didn't know that a financial advisor was something that they could utilize. And by seeing this, I felt like I needed to charge myself with the responsibility to go and get back. So when you went to New York and you saw how this thing worked, was there anything pulling on you, like this is something that I need to do? What was the thing, if you can think back to that time, what oh. made you want to take the leap? Yeah, gee, I'd love to say that um, it was much more than, um, you know, one of our start first tr stops was the Bankers Trust trading floor, which Bankers Trust is not around anymore, but that was a, that was a, you know, quite a high-flying firm at the time. This was late 80s, kind of Gordon Gecko era. Yeah. And, and, you know, Gosh. kid from Alabama, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you know. I want to try to take a shot at this. And yeah. so um, I wish I could say it was more than that, but it was really just, just seemed exciting, seemed something different. Uh, wanted to find my own way and uh, decided, I'd, decided I'd give it a shot, so. But so we're yeah. glad that you did give it a shot. So what was the first stop? You talked to me about um, making a bunch of cold calls. Tell us that story about that first job that you got after graduating from school in finance. Yeah, well, um, you know, needed to find a job, not in Alabama, just sent around a bunch of uh, letters, um, uh, literally cold called chief investment officers of very large firms. Um, you know, maybe part of it was I didn't know any better. <laughs> and um, a few, a few, uh, a few took my call and, they answered. Um, and, uh, and a large bank up here um, offered me a position and so I went to work there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what was called fund accounting, which was, uh, which was, um, you know, my nose is about this far from the computer screen, uh, adding machine on one hand, and and did that for a while, and then transition over to the marketing side, okay. um, and saw these folks that were, um, you know, going on trips, mm -hmm. and that would take people out to lunch, and I thought, uh, well, gee, that seems pretty interesting, and found out that those were the the quote advisors to institutional accounts, um, the Calpers of the world, etc., and they said, well. Uh, well, kid, we ain't going to give you a shot at that. And so I needed to go somewhere else to get some experience. Mm -hmm. And a regional bank was starting a mutual fund company. And so I finagled my way into that position. And the job they gave me, because they didn't have an experience in it, was actually on the phones with a headset. Okay. Um, uh, 800, uh, 800 Bay Funds. So it was a, uh, a bank here called Bay Bank. And um, you know, it wasn't an easy job, but looking back, um, that was just a great first experience because it was repetition and you know we were taking hundreds if not thousands of calls a day and mm -hmm. and really listening to what was important to people on the phone you know really helped me a lot yeah. and so that was my first kind of break-in was literally uh, 
giving advice and selling mutual funds on uh, on an 800 number at a at a regional bank. Were you nervous to kind of get on the phones? Because I know a lot of advisors hate talking on the phones, and I think we've moved away from the period of cold calling, 100 calls a day. I, I think, right? But for me, I was nervous to do it. But I found that I built so many relationships by doing those things, and I built confidence about myself to go out and find my ideal client. Um, how was that experience for you, the, the experience of prospecting and having these conversations at that time? Yeah, scared to death. Scared to death, right? Um, scared to death, and yet it helped me a lot in a bunch of different ways. Um, what ways? Little side story, I don't think we talked about this, but I was a severe stutterer growing up. Mm. Um, you know, big time stammering, couldn't hardly say my name. And speaking on the phone as a stutterer um, is actually very hard because it's speak on demand. Um, and that repetition of being on the phones, um, it, it was very frightening to me. Yeah. On the other hand, I viewed it as an opportunity to practice and get over my fears and, and, um, and it really helped a lot. Um, and the opportunity to really listen to people. Um, if you're on the phone, you know, somebody's, somebody's speaking directly into your ear, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and if you listen very carefully, I think you can, uh, you can learn a lot about what really drives people. And I think that's, you know, the, the human advisor, as you call this, yeah. right? It's, it's the human side of the business that is so important, um, maybe the most important as far as I'm concerned. I agree 100%. My mom used to tell me that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. And that's because you're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. Right, and I think that one of the things that I've learned as I've matriculated through the business is that our job is to listen far more than it is that we talk, right? Because you're able to hear people's fears, you're hear, able to hear people's concerns, and at the end of the day, 90% of this is about the person and their goals, and the other 10% is the strategies that we can put in place to help them get there. Um, after 1-800-BAY-FUNDS and that sent on the phone, did you go to Lehman right after that, or was there a space in between? Yeah, so, um, so my story maybe is about um, you know, seeing something interesting, um, you know, as we kind of joked, uh, mm -hmm. me not knowing any better uh, to some extent, yeah. um, not being around it. And so when I was at that regional bank, um, I again noticed these guys that had really nice offices mm -hmm. and they had um, expense reports and, and they had a private dining room for guys sakes. Well, that was a private banking group. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, hmm. That might be nice, uh, you know, not coming from much. And so I um, listened very carefully to people when they would call in and made a little list of people that had more money than others. Mm -hmm. And I took that list one day to the head of private banking and said, hey, by the way, I got a list of, you know, some folks that might be good prospects for your division. Um, uh, be happy to give you the list, but, uh, but you got to take me along with the list. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he kind of chuckled and said, all right, kid, I and, um, and so, uh, so I got a position um, you know, representing our private bank, um, which again was a uh, you know, kid from Alabama not growing up with much, uh, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? But, yeah. uh, but just kept trying and, and, um, and just asking and, and saying, you know, well, gee, why not? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just because it's been done a certain way in the past doesn't mean that it's the way it needs to be done in the future. And so that's a big, that's a big thing, you know, with my kids. I'm always saying, you know, don't be shy about asking why. Can we touch on that for a minute? I feel like asking, right, like what's the worst that can happen? For me, it was like, why not me? That was my question to myself. Yeah. Like if I'm seeing these people have success on the playing field, if I'm seeing them have success in college, if I'm seeing them having success in business, why not me? And I think that we discount that audacity to ask. Um, what made you so comfortable with asking, why not me? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, uh, you know, maybe part of it was, was wanting to make it, mm -hmm. right? Not, not wanting to go home because I didn't want to go home, yeah. uh, but not wanting to have to go home, right? Yeah. Um, you know, saying, hey, Doug, on it. I picked up, I moved up here. Oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Um, you know, I wanna make it, yeah. right? I wanna make mom proud. Um, wanna make my, uh, my grandparents proud. And, and, you know, maybe looking back, I haven't thought much about this, but, um, 
you know that uh, that that wanting to make it, not wanting to fail, um, you know, really drove me drove me hard, especially early, uh, mm -hmm. to just well, gee, why not? What's the worst thing that happened? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I would have to go home to Alabama, but you know, loving family, not so bad, right? So uh, so I just kept going for it. So I know that a lot of advisors struggle with something called imposter syndrome, right? Where they have to act a certain way and they feel like they're not necessarily that person yet. Did you ever feel that as you were asking, why not me? Because um, you didn't have the corner office at the time. You didn't have the private dining room or the expense sheet. So like, how did you harness the confidence to say, hey, I'm going to take this paper of high net worth individuals and I'm going to go to the managing director and I'm going to offer him a deal. I'm going to tell him like, you can have these prospects, quote unquote, but I'm coming with you. I think that takes a great deal of um, confidence and a lot of emerging advisors especially might struggle with that con confidence as they try to build their businesses or build their practices. Well, you know, you just touched on it, right? Yeah. You know, that, that kind of why or why not, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, um, it um, you know, what's the worst thing going to happen? Somebody mm -hmm. says no. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's not that big of a deal. In fact, in some ways, you know, this is a saying in the industry, a quick no is great, mm -hmm. right? You know, move on next. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, maybe part of it was, was, uh, was, was being a little bit naive, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, gee, well, why shouldn't I ask that person this? Or why shouldn't I go into that room? Or why shouldn't I, um, you know, not feel nervous in front of a large crowd talking? Um, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, uh, you know, maybe some of it was actually thinking back, uh, you know, I had a lot of things happen, especially around me being a cigarette stutterer, where people gave me a hard time about being a stutterer. And, yeah. and um, you know, well, I've been through that. Can't get much worse than that yeah. um, in terms of people, um, uh, you know, not appreciating that I was a stutterer. And so, uh, gee, what the heck. Right? Yeah. How did you overcome that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, one of it was in speech therapy when I was a little kid mm -hmm. was actually back to the phone. Uh, the, uh, the person who was my therapist suggested that, um, that I spend a lot of time on the phone. And so, so, um, so I, speaking of cold calling, I, f I forgot about this. My, my first foray, my true first foray into the financial services world was after I switched my major and I wanted to get a job in the business and there was one of these job fairs and um, an insurance company was offering, uh, they called it internships, right, to go work for the insurance company. Well, lo and behold, I show up and it was a phone in a phone book, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my assignment was, um, you know, all right, kid, go call the M's in the phone book and come back with a bunch of leads, right, so that you can pass them on to our salespeople. And that was right about the time that I was doing speech therapy and yeah. I thought, hey, this, this ain't gonna be fun, but you know, yeah. my therapist said I should practice, so here goes. <laughs> there you go. And I think that's an important note. Like, if you're an advisor and you are afraid of something, the best way to kind of get over that fear is tackle it head on, right? Um, my mom used to say that success is on the other side of fear, right? So if you are scared of this thing, if you think that this thing is the pathway to your growth, that's the way that you have to do it. I remember, I don't know where I was, maybe like in church one time, and the guy said, you can't get around it, you can't get under it, you can't get over it, you have to go through it. And I think that's an important lesson for a lot of advisors to note is that there are no shortcuts to success, whether that's personally or professionally, right? Um, and I think that you did just that with the speech therapy. I wanted to touch on your Lehman Brothers um, kind of period of your life. How was that experience? And take us through um, 08 and how that whole thing felt because a lot of young advisors that are coming up didn't live through that crisis, weren't advising through that crisis. Take us through that journey. Yeah, well, so that journey ended up from the regional bank, a um, uh, uh, few different stops in private banking, and a firm called Newberger Berman, um, who's still around and doing extremely well, mm -hmm. um, wanted to start an office in New England. And so I joined Newberger, um, ended up starting the office here, um, uh, and then Lehman acquired us. Um, as I joke, uh, Lehman. Um, Took us out twice, uh, once in a good way, once poof, mm -hmm. and um, but 
coming up to that, you know, 08, um, you know, a lot of us should have seen it coming. Mm -hmm. um, people, I think, are, uh, you know, not being, um, uh, you know, up front if they, if they say they did saw it com coming. Um, uh, but I certainly remember that, um, you know, that summer, um, or maybe after Bear Stearns fell, mm -hmm. um, when um, we all knew there was something going on, and, and we, we thought we were going to make it. Um, I remember that kind of final weekend. Um, I was with my family um, on a vacation, and um, you know we thought the firm was going to make it. And then um, Sunday at about the crack of dawn, um, I get a phone call. Um, we need you back at the office, and uh, and I kind of knew then that uh, whoops, uh, you know, not so good. And so, um, so left the house. It was still dark outside. Um, got back to the office, you know, all day. Kind of war gaming is what we're going to say. And we um, we were allowed to send out a note to clients um, after midnight because the bankruptcy was the filing of the Monday morning, mm -hmm. which, by the way, tomorrow is the anniversary of that of that poof. Timely. Um, and um, so I prepared emails. I sent out emails to all my clients at twelve oh one. Uh, you know, stay at the office. I think I might have gone home to shower and, you know, come back. Mm -hmm. And I think I, we talked about this story a little bit. The good story. Um, and, yeah, the good story. I, I wrote a little kind of blog or two about this, um, you know, kind of telling it. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of tough stories and a lot of, you know, people, um, you know, were harmed by the financial crisis, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, the, why I called it the good story was what happened around you know, 6 a.m., which was at my phone ring. Mm -hmm. And it was a longtime client, still a client today, actually. And he called me up and he said, um, well, gee, I figured you'd be there. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, how are you? And I went into my, my prepared Advisable. remarks, right? Yeah. And he stepped back and he said, well, you didn't hear me. I said, how are you? Mm -hmm. and, and I kind of, you know, broke down a little bit and still kind of almost get a little emotional talking about it today because he wanted to know how I was as a person. Yeah. And, um, and then he stepped back and said, um, hey, you're going to have a tough day. I just want to let you know that I'm with you. And if you want me to call any of your clients on your behalf to let them know that I'm with you, uh, you just let me know. Yeah. And the good story in that, I think, is you know what a lot of experienced what a lot of us experienced again last year, or maybe still experiencing, is, is you know, humans being humans. Yeah. Um, humans, you know, valuing those human connections really more than anything else. And I think it, as advisors, is why I love that you call this the human advisor. Yeah. Um, you know, understanding the human side of this business, I think, is much more important, or certainly just as important, if not much more important, than, than understanding the, the, quote, financial side of this business. Absolutely, in the words of a former guest, he said that we get the numbers right and the people wrong. And I think that the advice business starts and ends with the people. So to me, it doesn't make sense to not be human within your practice, right? Because what people want is somebody that they can trust. One person that's gonna exercise both of their ears, right? To listen to their fears, their, their goals and their dreams and are gonna help them get there. And I think that if we remember that in the center of all that we do, that leads to impact. This is something that this is a hill I'll die on is that advisors are supposed to be what I call servant leaders, right? Serving their clients, but also being an example of what they should be doing from a financial standpoint, right? Like taking their own medicine. And I think that if you start with the people at the center, if you uh, really own a servant leader's mindset and attitude, there's really no way that you can fail. And I see that with you and a lot of the guests that we've been fortunate enough to interview on this podcast. So. Um, I appreciate you being an example of that because that allows me to look forward and say, like, Preston is doing it. I can continue to grow and do this thing. Um, I talk about, you know, my phrase in terms of being an advisor and having colleagues that I can collaborate with. First and foremost, it's always going to be collaboration over competition. I don't look at any other advisor, even if they're in the same niche as me, as competition. But that's somebody that I can work with and collaborate with, right? And then I say this all the time, push-pull. Like as a young advisor, as a, as a growing advisor, 
um, I have the responsibility to push those ahead of me forward and cheer them on, like, Preston, continue to do what you're doing, right? But for those emerging advisors that are coming uh, behind me, I have a responsibility to show them the way, pull them behind me, just like you did for me, taking the time to have a conversation with me, encourage me, and tell me about your upbringing and how we're the same. So, um, yeah, I think people are the center. And if you forget that, you get lost in this space. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, people want to know that they're talking to someone who can understand you know, what they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, needs, wants, desires, fears. Um, you know, money is highly emotional. Yeah. And I think we, um, we, we make it sometimes non-emotional. We make it quantitative. We make it models. We make it products. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've always thought that, you know, spend the extra time to understand the person first, um, the family first, what they're, what's really driving them. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, I, I sit down with folks and, and, and we, we deal with folks that have, you know, a little bit extra money sometimes and, and, and I often sit down and I say, um, you know, what kind of thumbprint do you want to leave in the world? Yeah. And, and often it makes them step back and, and they say, well, what do you mean? They say, well, look, you're, 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 you're doing well, um, you know, what's really important? Right, you're you're likely to leave some behind. Mm -hmm. um, you know what what kind of impact do you want to make? Kids, community, you know, etc. And let's and let's start with that. What's really important to you in terms of what you really want to try to achieve and and what you're concerned about. Um, and only then can we start talking about a model or a product or a, yeah. or a factor or a, you know whatever. Um, but I think we uh, I think we can make this business too complicated sometimes. At the end of the day, it's, you know, we're, we're, um, we're talking to people and, and we need to understand what's important to them first and foremost. Okay, so for the advisor um, that is looking for gems to have similar success as you, um, I know the good, the good story is a great example of human advice. What are a couple things or a piece of advice that you can give them? What would you tell yourself maybe 10, 15 years ago about leading in a practice as a human first? Um, just, just try to, try to step back from all the quantitative, you know, model orientation of our business. Mm -hmm. you know, understand it, no doubt about it, you gotta understand it. But, but don't get too anchored on it. Um, you know, spend more time, um, you know, reading about human interactions, spending more time, you know, out in your community understanding what drives people because um, it's it's understanding the human experience mm -hmm. I think is just so so important in our business um, versus understanding the potential final financial outcomes you know you you said a few minutes ago we we get the numbers right um, I think I'm at a joke with you you know I'm not so, so sure that we get the numbers right very often mm -hmm. to be quite frank with you and um, you know maybe and sometimes letting clients even know that Right, that 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 we don't know, um, uh, but we're here to listen. We're here to, you know, share what what um, what what we have learned, and together mm -hmm. um, help chart a path. And and then really importantly, you know, sticking to that path. Right, it's it's you know, I think success in this business, success is investing is is how you control your emotions uh, based upon what's thrown at you. Yeah. Um, you know, the markets last year was a prime example, right? Did you, did you feel so comfortable with your advisor? Did you have those relationships with back with your clients as a fellow human being mm -hmm. that you stepped back from it and just stuck to the plan because they felt so comfortable with the plan yeah. versus you know, reacting emotionally to when the market was dropping a couple thousand points a day? And I think that's um, really hard to do if you don't have those human connections back with folks. So what can we do as advisors? Are we charged with just making sure that our clients are comfortable with sharing their lives and their worlds with us? Because there's a trust building factor in those gems, right? And we can't discount the fact that it's our responsibility to give the client something or someone to believe in, right? To trust in. So when these moments of hardship, when they do arise, they're able to think twice or be counterintuitive about 
the circumstance or the noise. I always tell my clients that you have to uh, separate the news from the noise, right? And they're able to tune into the plan and the news that will help them get to where they're trying to go. So what do you have to say about trust building? I mean, that's an important part of what we do. And they're entrusting their financial lives to us, right? Yeah. Well, look, certainly you got to know the numbers. You got to know the field. You got to understand um, various solutions. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Don't want to discount that. Um, but um, but I think in terms of trust building, you know, what I said before, um, uh, you know, letting clients understand that that sometimes you don't know, mm -hmm. and sometimes you're, you know, shaken by what's going on as well. Mm -hmm. But together, you spent hopefully a ton of time up front understanding what really drives them, what's really important, what they're really nervous about, yeah. and developing a plan, and then just helping them stick to that plan, um, and admitting sometimes that it's not easy for you either. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I think that just just letting people know that 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 you're human as well. At least from my experience, I found that it helps you know, build a lot of trust and that you're in this with them yeah. um, as, a, as a fellow person. That's good advice. Uh, Preston, I'd be remiss if I don't mention the great work that you're doing in the city of Boston and beyond. Um, I think about giving in a standpoint of that. The best things in my life have come from being a cheerful giver. And I think there's so much emphasis on getting in our world, right? Like the people that you associate yourself with, you're networking to get something from them, right? When in fact, the best way to network, and I remember working for a boss, my first job, he would say that networking is one letter away from not working, right? The best way to build relationships is to give, right? Um, you have a school, your impact in the city of Boston. Talk about your giving efforts and your philanthropic efforts that you're doing around this city and beyond. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, you know, very important. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about, you know, both of our upbringings um, kind of off camera and, you know, your household as well. You guys gave back a ton, even though you didn't have a lot, right? Mm -hmm. We always had a, we always had three jars uh, for my allowance and it was, um, uh, you know, uh, save a third, spend a third, give a third. And, um, you know, you talk about this a ton and I believe it a lot. You know, you, you, uh, you get what you give, so to speak. And, and um, you know, growing up, my mom was a school teacher for 40 years. And so education is, and educational opportunities for children is extremely important to me. And so um, I had the opportunity to help with some schools around town and had somebody come to me and, and, and a few others and ask us to, um, to help uh, start a charter school here in Boston. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just been very fortunate. Um, still on the foundation board there, not as active as I, as I once was, but, um, you know, very proud of that and still extremely involved. And, and whether it be giving back to, you know, help your soul, whether it be giving back to, to network, um, you know, we're in a field that uh, if, you're, if you're successful, you have the opportunity to do pretty well. And, um, you know, why not share a little bit? Uh, I've always found that it comes back, uh, uh, you know, much more than I've given, I, I get. Um, and and uh, not to mention, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people need some help. Absolutely. Um, the thing I like about you is that you're definitely practicing what you preach. Um, and it's something for advisors like myself that are emerging to aspire to. Um, I'm curious, what's next for Preston McSwain and Fiduciary Wealth Partners? Um, you know, certainly continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. um, I think you and I might talked about this before. It's um, you know responsibility to to run a successful business on behalf of um, you know family, community, um, clients. You want to be able to you know have successful people working around you so that you can give the best advice. And so you know certainly looking to grow, but um, but not looking to grow just for growth's sake. Um, you know, want to make sure that we that we maintain a culture that. That is um, that is uh, fiduciary oriented. That um, really does, you know, think about clients first and foremost, and and um, you know, humans first, product second, um, and uh, and you know, trying to build out an old-fashioned partnership here to where 
we're all sharing, um, we're all contributing, um, we're all receiving benefits, and and ultimately that's going to accrue to the benefit of the client, which is which is you know so important. That's amazing, Preston. I appreciate you joining me here on this podcast. Um, for everybody watching, where can they follow up with you, your blog, and everything that you're doing at Fiduciary Wealth Partners? Yeah, so um, uh, fiduciarywealth.com. Uh, come check us out. We have a uh, an ideas and insights section um, uh, where we post some things. We've um, we've got now what we call a research roundtable, which are um, outside experts to where we collaborate with and try to uh, post uh, thought-provoking things that hopefully um, allow us to be better advisors. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you so much, Preston. And thank you all for tuning in to another episode of The Human Advisor. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. We appreciate you, and we'll see you here again soon.